Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be covering the Gordon Murray T50S, the racing version of the T50, which if you haven't yet you should check out my video on. Now this car still has the fan, but instead of six modes there's just one, high downforce. The fan spins at a constant 7000 RPM and many added aerodynamic features means this thing is making crazy crazy downforce. Yes, even enough to drive upside down. Now all we have is a sketch of the T50S, but there's actually a lot we can learn from it. There's a prominent new roof scoop working as a ram air intake to increase horsepower. We can see the driver has an 18 degree field of view and is reclined about 33 degrees. We can also see that if the driver were to spit, it would land approximately on the windshield in front of them, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense since they're clearly wearing a helmet. Nah, I'm not so sure about this sketch. Heading to the back of the car, we can see a massive fin trailing from the roof scoop to help with high speed stability. There's also a very tiny arrow, hard to see, but you can follow the tail of it, and that leads you to what appears to be a rear tire. Jury's still out on what brand they are. Okay, so the sketch only tells us so much about this car, so let's walk through some of the absurd numbers associated with it. So if you want a car to go around a track as quickly as possible, you might think, well, just throw a ton of horsepower at it. But actually, horsepower won't be all that useful in creating very good lap times. Two things can play a far larger role if you take advantage of them, reducing the weight of your vehicle and maximizing downforce. So if you think back to the 2016 Viper ACR, it went around and it smashed a ton of lap records for production cars. And the Viper is fairly heavy, you know, it's about 3,400 pounds, um, and it only has about 600 some horsepower. So there's nothing crazy looking at those stats. But what it has working in its favor is an absurd amount of downforce, about 1,700 pounds of downforce, 770 kilograms, and because of that downforce, it produced about 1.5 lateral G's of grip and was able to smash all of these track records because it had so much grip. So that's what this T50S is going for, and we're going to use the road car benchmark of the Viper ACR to just demonstrate how absurd uh, this T50S is. Now as far as a simple discussion about grip, we have our car driving along down the road and it has a certain mass and it has a certain amount of downforce. And so we can think of our grip in terms of G's, the lateral grip that the car will be able to sustain or break with, uh, in terms of its mass plus its downforce divided by its mass. So think for example if you had a car with zero downforce. It would have mass over mass, that's just one, about one G of grip. Uh, so we're just assuming a frictional coefficient of our tires here of one, but essentially our car has one G of grip. Now if we add downforce to that, we increase our G's here. So for example, we can look at our Viper ACR, which has a mass of 1540 kilograms, downforce of 770 kilograms, and that gives us a grip of 1.5 G's. Now that's assuming those tires once again are pretty basic. If you had some pretty advanced tires, something with a frictional coefficient of 1.2, well that's basically a multiplier effect for your G's here, and so you'd be at around 1.8 G's. Now let's compare that to an absurd track only car, the Senna GTR. The thing only weighs uh, about 1200 kilograms, that's the dry weight, and it has about a thousand kilograms of downforce. So using our same simple little equation here, we're at 1.84 G's. Uh, if we have super sticky tires, you know, 2.2 G's of grip. Now again, this is a track only car here, uh, and it's capable of somewhere around, you know, two G's of grip, which is insane. Uh, but we, we move on to our Gordon Murray T50S, it's 300 kilograms less than a Senna GTR with 500 kilograms more of downforce. So what does that mean in terms of grip? About 2.69 Gs, and then, you know, we put some sticky tires on there, 1.2 uh, frictional coefficient, and we were at 3.2 Gs. Now, these here, uh, we're calculating without the weight of a driver. Uh, McLaren's always given dry weight. This might also be dry weight. Uh, so, you know, you can take these down a little bit here. Uh, but in Gordon Murray's uh, press release, they're saying they've seen in braking uh, peak grip of up to 3 Gs. So absolutely absurd, um, nearly double what you're seeing in a road car. 
Okay, so how does this translate to track time? So let's just take a very simple example and say we're going around in a circle here. And so we have a 250 meter circle, which gives us a total circumference of about 1,570 meters or about one mile. So we're going around in this circle here and we're trying to figure out how quickly can we do it in different scenarios. So what's happening is your car is turning and as it's turning, the acceleration force makes it wanna go away from that circle but the tires are gripping to that road and they're giving you a force uh, resisting that outward acceleration. So if you set these two forces equal to each other, you can find out the maximum velocity that you go around this circle. So that's essentially what we're doing, looking at different levels of grip from a basic road car with about one G of lateral grip, uh, all the way to perhaps our Gordon Murray T50S with 2.5 Gs of grip. So you can plug in the numbers here if you would like. One thing to note, uh, which you might kind of question, why are we multiplying downforce by gravity? Because certainly downforce isn't a mass. Uh, but yet here's, you know, kind of a flaw with the metric discussion of downforce in kilograms. Kilograms is a mass and yet very frequently uh, in metric, which I did this video in uh, for all the metric folks out there. Uh, but discussing downforce in terms of mass in kilograms isn't all that logical to do. You'd multiply it by 9.81 so that you can get that in units of newtons. All that aside, we're looking at what kind of speeds can we actually go around this circle. So if you had a car with one G of grip, that would be going around the circle at about 110 miles per hour or 180 kilometers per hour. Uh, if you had a car with 1.5 Gs of grip, you're at 135 miles per hour or 220 uh, kilometers per hour. And then if you had this T50S and we're saying that it has 2.5, G's of grip with downforce, uh, 175 miles per hour or 280 kilometers per hour. Now, what is this in terms of time? So we know the circumference, we know how fast we're going, we can see how long it takes to go around that circle. 32 seconds for the average road car, 26 seconds for that Dodge Viper, and about 20 seconds for our T50S. Now, realistically, it might not be at 2.5s. It'll probably be somewhere in the 2 to 2.5 Gs. So we're really looking at about 20 to 22 seconds. But think about that. This car is going around this circle in 20 to 22 seconds. And no other road car out there uh, could do it uh, in less than about 26 seconds. So it is absolutely absurd. I mean, this the scale of this is a tiny little one mile track with you know, 26 second lap times, and we're taking six seconds off of that. Absolutely incredible. And the, the benefits aren't just on cornering. So you might say, well, this is a circle. Of course it's gonna do better because it's just cornering. On a straight line, you get to break so much later because you have that high grip, so you can carry your full speed down towards the end of the straight and then break super, super late and then have a higher corner entry speed. So it just kind of multiplies around the entire track and you just end up dominating as long as you have high downforce, low weight, you just start crushing because you have so much lateral grip. All right, let's move on to driving upside down. And you've probably heard, you know, plenty of cars out there say, hey, you know, at this speed, this car could actually drive upside down. But there's often some things that are overlooked or not discussed when talking about a car driving upside down. So the very basics of how does it work? Well, if your car's weight uh, is equal to your car's downforce, which in this case is basically an up force, then you have equal forces in each direction. And so your car doesn't fall if it's driving upside down. But if we go back to thinking about our grip equation, that's basically now gonna be downforce minus our mass divided by our mass. And in this case, because they're equal, you have zero on top of this equation, so you have zero grip. And so at the moment when you have enough downforce to hold the car to the road, you have zero grip. So you're basically just floating. You can't do anything with that. And the other thing to think about is, in that scenario, you would still have to have your center of pressure line up with your center of gravity. So for example, if the mass of the car is centered here and the center of pressure for downforce is centered here, well, that means that the thing's gonna start to rotate. Even if the forces are equal, it's gonna start rotating and the front of the car is gonna come up. You're gonna have all that air hit it and then you're done. You know, you fall and crash and hopefully you make it. So there's, there's several things that have to happen. You have to drive at a much greater speed in order to actually drive upside down. And so in the case of this Gordon Murray T50S, uh, with Car and Driver, they were saying that they could, you know, have this equal out at 175 miles an hour and then a top speed of about 210. 
So if you are actually driving at that top speed of 210 miles per hour and actually able to get that 3G of grip, you know, if you were the right way up, well, in this case, you'd basically be driving with 1G of grip. And so if you were upside down at its max speed, it would behave a lot like a normal road car would on the road. Uh, that's kind of scary because you can't slow down. You can't really turn all that much. If, if you start doing anything that upsets that aerodynamic flow, then you just fall again and crash. So it's a, it's a very sketchy thing, but it would be really cool to see at some point uh, an example of this being done. Okay, so let's move on to the engine and they made some pretty cool changes for this engine in order for it to make more horsepower. So it's still that same four liter naturally aspirated V12 revving to the same 12,100 RPM, absolutely insane. Uh, but now instead of 663 metric horsepower, uh, thanks to not having any emissions equipment or you know noise control through your exhaust, uh, because this is a track only car, it's making 700 uh, metric horsepower and then that 700 gets bumped to 730 metric horsepower the actual total output or about 720 horsepower uh, because that roof scoop is elevated a bit out of the boundary layer from the car where that air is starting to move slower so it's up in the fresh air and so it's able to use that ram air effect and get about an additional 30 metric horsepower uh, so very crazy that this thing you know 720 horsepower out of a four liter or about 180 horsepower per liter from a naturally aspirated engine and you know for comparison the highest road legal naturally aspirated uh, engine would be the T50 at 164 and this is significantly higher than that um, so you know a car like the Ferrari 458 is around 130 horsepower per liter so this is absurd that in a naturally aspirated engine you're getting 180 horsepower per liter more than double uh, with that Viper engine is doing uh, and a lot of that is because this thing revs so high now the engine of course if you're going to go around a track really quickly is matched with a paddle shift gearbox so that's neat that they have that for the track only version uh, and something i think worth discussing is that this car is just on regular old you know road legal street tires both the three million dollar t50 version and the more than three million dollar uh, t50s version uh, you know, the road legal version coming with Pilot Sport 4S tires and the track version coming with Michelin Cup 2s. So, you know, something I think that's often overlooked is when people are modifying their cars, uh, they immediately want to go to horsepower. When in reality, you know, you can get the same tires as this $3 million supercar and stick them on your car. And from a grip standpoint, from a base grip standpoint, you're starting off relatively the same. And then of course, this has so much down force that it's able to just completely smash all those records as far as what a road car would be capable of. So it's a very neat car, very cool engineering, and thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.